Okay, well, welcome everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. By the look of the number of people here, it seems like there's an interest in IOL power calculations, and a very warm welcome to all of you uh, here in Vienna. Today, we're going to talk about uh, some new emerging technology for intraocular lens calculations and, and sort of a disruptive technology. Throughout our careers, we've all been used to using vergence formulas or, or variations on that theme. And we now know that there are other ways to do this. There are other approaches. And some of these other approaches hold out the possibility of being able to go places in terms of accuracy that we've not seen before. And that's going to be the focus of what we're going to talk about today. We have uh, with us uh, uh, three other speakers, uh, Dr. Goldblum from the University of Basel in Switzerland, Dr. Uh, Kajerbu from, um, from Copenhagen in Denmark, and then Dr. Uh, Luthra from northern India. And each of, us, each of them is going to give uh, their own perspective on this calculation method and how it's impacted their practice and some of the new insights that they've gained. So I'm going to start off by giving you an update on where we're going with this. As you all know, that this is an artificial intelligence model. It's continuously evolving. And as we add more and more cases and increase the depth and the breadth of the artificial intelligence model, our ability to do things in new ways increases. So let me give you a, a little background on how we did this and what we're going to be doing with it in the future. And then we'll follow with Dr. Kajerbu. Um, may I have my presentation, please? Okay, so this is going to be an update on the, the Hill RBF method. These are my disclosures. And every time we go into the operating room, what plays in the background is that elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room for all of us is IOL power selection accuracy. And we all know that virgins formulas have limitations, and that's because one part of a virgins formula, the effective lens position, can only be estimated. It cannot really be calculated. And this is just part of the Haggis Formula Optimization Database with over 270,000 implantations. And what we found over the years is less than 1% of physicians were at 92% uh, accuracy for half a diopter. About 6% of surgeons are at 84%, and the vast majority of surgeons are around 78%. And because this number comes up over and over and over again, it tells us that it's a limitation of technology. Now, for those of you who implant uh, multifocal lenses, extended depth of field lenses, or toric lenses, 78% accuracy looks like this, graphically represented. And, and this probably is not as good as we need to be in order to do this. So how can we further improve this? Well, we need to think a little differently. And what we're going to talk about today is a new application of artificial intelligence that's very flexible and free of calculation bias. It's continuously evolving. We have 40 investigators in 17 or 18 countries constantly feeding us data. And uh, from that, we can expand the artificial intelligence model. And this is truly a worldwide collaborative effort. This is not the work of one person. It's the work of 40 different individuals plus Hogstrite, the company. It's not the, it's not the thinking of also one person or, or how they view things. It's entirely data driven. These are our investigators around the world, and you can see pretty much every continent is represented. And many of these individuals are the very best um, and most accomplished ophthalmologists in their respective countries, and this is a listing of them. So we have North America, the Middle East, Africa, Australia, Europe, South America, India, and Asia represented amongst our investigators. Now, why does this matter? Why is this, why is this any better than just a regular virgins formula? Well, it's a sophisticated method of optimizing uh, outcomes based entirely on data. And current methods really limit possibilities to what we already understand. And with artificial intelligence, we can go places and develop relationships within the calculation process that were pretty much previously unknown. It's self-organizing, which means it can come up with solutions that we never thought were important before. And it has enhanced sensitivity for identifying complex nonlinear relationships. And the human eye is without question a Chinese puzzle. If you think about how many possible combinations of axial length, central corneal power, anterior chamber depth, uh, given spherical equivalent for an IOL power there are, and we're talking millions of combinations, and a simple two-dimensional regression algorithm is not going to work for that. 
and it's free of calculation bias. This is one of the more important things. Each of us know that for a very short eye, a very long eye, an eye with very steep Ks, we all have our favorite methods, and this doesn't matter. It's just uh, a pattern recognition. So let's look at some patterns here. Um, think of how little information you have here, and yet our brains are set up for pattern recognition, and we can identify each one of these images and all we have is just a black line against a white background. Our brains are set up for this, but we can also write computer algorithms that do the same thing. And we can look at uh, axial length, anterior chamber depth, central corneal power, spherical equivalent for a given eye well power, and we can call that a pattern. And with the sophisticated mathematics that we have right now in the scary fast computers, we can come up with artificial intelligence models that give us these kinds of um, outcomes that we would like. And this is an example that you may have seen before. This is 1,000 seemingly random points put inside this little square, but they're actually not random. They have a pattern, and they were generated by something called a Manhattan distance generator. And the Manhattan distance is the distance from one side of town to the other walking around the buildings. We can't walk through buildings, so we kind of have to walk in a stepwise fashion across uh, various city blocks. So this would be the Manhattan distance as opposed to a Euclidean distance, which is just a straight line as the bird would fly. And we're going to ask a neural network to find the internal organization of this seemingly chaotic collection of random dots. And we're going to give it 5,000 times to do that. And with the very big computers we have, that's about 0.1 seconds. So here we are at 40 cycles, 120 cycles, 500 cycles. And by the time we get to 5,000 cycles, we've taken this cloud of seemingly unrelated data points and we've found its internal organization. So just imagine how powerful this can be when we're looking to do lens power calculations. We're using similar technology that's been refined and optimized for the process of lens power calculations. Now, one of the problems with ophthalmology is it's full of ophthalmologists. And if you want to, if you want to solve a problem in optics, physics, and engineering, you don't ask ophthalmologists, you ask physicists, engineers, and mathematicians, and that's exactly what we did. We went to these individuals at MathWorks and said, here's, here's the problem, and they helped us with the solution. And they said, by the way, in engineering, we have a number of other tools that you might not be available, uh, you might not be aware of, rather, and we've incorporated these standard engineering tools into the process of lens calculations. Now, the engineers at MathWorks didn't know anything about ophthalmology, and I was unfamiliar with all the tools that go along with engineering-based statistical models and artificial intelligence, and we basically just trained each other. And I'm going to share with you one of the common engineering tools that's used in this field of mathematics, and it will help to explain to you what you see when you do these calculations. So here's what's called a pairwise boundary model. It's the um, relationship between central corneal power and axial length. And we have the ability to draw boundaries around this. And if the data points fall within these boundaries, we can predict the outcomes. And again, this is a standard engineering tool. So within the shaded area of this boundary model, we know that if, if the data points fall within this area and five other boundary models, we have a 90% chance of a half diopter accuracy in the calculation. So if you see an inbounds and out of bounds calculation, this is what we're referring to, this standard engineering tool. And I'll show you how this works in terms of a calculation you might put into the calculator. So here are the six pairwise boundary models we're using for this artificial intelligence model. This is the first version. This is based on 3,400 eyes. And we'll take a pretty standard eye, a little bit myopic, 26 millimeters, uh, normal Ks, normal anterior chamber depth. And you can see that all of the green dots fall within each of the six pairwise boundary models. This is what's called an inbounds calculation, again, a standard engineering tool. Now, let's do something a little different. Let's have a very long eye. We'll have very steep Ks in a very shallow anterior chamber, something pretty unusual. And you can see that two of these data points fall outside the boundary models. So for a case like this, with the first version of the uh, RBF calculator, you would get an out-of-bounds calculation. It means I don't have the data to support the calculation accuracy at a 90% level. So this is the very first calculation method in ophthalmology that tells you how it's going to do before you do the case, and I think that's valuable. So let's take that same case, and now we're going to expand the boundary model to 12,400 cases, and 28 millimeters on the axial length, steep Ks, and uh, shallow anterior chamber, and you can see now that what were out-of-bounds uh, data points 
now become inbound, inbounds, the greater the number of cases that we have. Now you might have two cases where you get the same lens power, but one is an inbounds calculation and the other is an out-of-bound calculation. You just saw why that happened. Some of the data points may fall outside the boundary models. And as we go from 12,000 to 30,000 to 100,000 cases, as you can imagine, the boundary models are going to get larger and larger and larger, and we'll have fewer out-of-bounds calculations. So this was the first prospective study done on the first version of this in 2016. Three different study sites, wide range of axial lengths, IOL powers, anterior chamber depths, central corneal power. And this is what we found, and this was very, very gratifying. What we found was that for these consecutive cases, for all eyes, it was about 91%. Remember, the boundary model was set at 90%. So this, this confirmed that. And for normal eyes, we did a little bit better. For the axial myope, we didn't expect to see anything like this, 98% within half a diopter. And some of this has to do with the fact that the effective lens position isn't as important with very low power lenses. Um, but the, the, the part that really mattered and is having a long lasting impression on the ophthalmic community is how well this method did for the short eye. Because all of us who do surgery on short eyes know that these are the eyes that are most likely to give us a refractive surprise and often an unpleasant myopic refractive surprise, minus 150, minus 2, minus 3. We were 84% and these were some pretty amazing numbers and Dr. Goldblum is going to talk about his experience with very short eyes. And we made, diving down just a little deeper, this is what we found with our very myopic eyes. I mean, very hyperopic eyes, these very short eyes. So we did very well. Now, other studies have started to come out. This is Dr. Roman's group. This was presented at ASCRS in 2016. And look at what he came up with, the exact same thing, around 90%. For inbounds calculations, it's, it's validating the boundary model approach. Now, this is the online calculator now. It's, it was an act of enormous generosity on the part of Hogstrite that not only can you get this on the Lenstar, but it's available to every single person in the world for free. So we have a calculator here, and that's the address. And we thought, you know, the uh, surgeons are kind of slow to adapt. I mean, some people in Germany are still using SRK2. We thought maybe this might take 10 years for people to catch up. Well, it turns out that in the first um, one to third week, you know, we had over you know, 9,000 calculations, 75,000 calculations in the first 30 weeks. And in 2017, we had 180,000 calculations on this website. That was pretty, pretty amazing for us. So the adaption has been, or adoption rather, has been um, very, very high. This is where we are right now, where the artificial intelligence model is now based on 12,400 cases. We go down to minus five and up to plus 30. And again, very broad range of axial length, central corneal power, and anterior chamber depth. So if, this is what the calculator looks like. You can click on what is this, and it will explain to you um, what, what the methodology is. And if you're as nerdy as I am and you want to go deep, dive deeply down into the mathematics, it actually shows you all the complicated mathematics that use. it uses. You can enter the calculator. And what's different now as opposed to before is that you can now enter the spherical equivalent. Before, everything was targeted at Plano because we didn't have a big enough database to support other calculations. And now, if you look in the upper right-hand corner, I can change the spherical equivalent and the IOL power changes as well. So you can put in your target spherical equivalent. We've increased the number of normal cases, and to that, we've added unusual Ks and unusual anterior chamber depths. We've included the extreme axial myope up to 37 millimeters in the axial length. And we've added 1,000 very short eyes to enhance the accuracy for the very short eye. Now, anytime you follow science, you get taught new and important lessons. And one of the lessons we've been taught is that we can uncover new relationships that we didn't feel were important before or we didn't even know existed. And our friends in Singapore and in China have been telling us for years that the formulas that are currently available, mostly optimized against European populations, don't work for the Chinese eye. Their outcomes are not very good. And we now know why, because the Chinese eye is different than the Caucasian eye. And they've been telling us this for years, we just haven't been listening. We now have the tools, the mathematical tools, to make calculators for this subset of, of people, this ethnic group. 
And the next project for Hogstrike and the RBF team is to come up with a calculator specific for the ethnic Chinese eye. And I think this is going to be something very important. A simple virgins formula might not be able to see these differences, but an artificial intelligence model specifically for this uh, can. So a multi-study, uh, multi-center study is currently being set up of some of the largest centers in China. These are some of our investigators, as well as investigators in, uh, in Singapore and also in Hong Kong. And this is going to be the next place we're going to go. We're going to try and uh, optimize things for the Chinese eye. So in my experience, you know, ophthalmology is uh, experiencing a convergence of technologies. We now have ray tracing, artificial intelligence, interoperative aberrometry, and very advanced virgins formulas like the Barrett Universal II formula. But the method with the greatest flexibility and sensitivity, I think, is going to win the race. Right now, 78% accuracy is, is tolerable. That's what most people get. 84% um, is acceptable. That would be an upper tier with current technology. But 90% or greater is actually achievable uh, with what we have right now today, and I think this is very exciting. So this is where we are right now, 78%. This is where we can be right now with the RBF method and also with the Lenstar. And the goal of this group is nothing more, nothing less than the complete elimination of the refractive surprise, given enough time, enough cases, and enough dedication to this project. And eventually that elephant in the room will fade away and we'll be able to concentrate on other things. Thank you very much. So next we're going to have uh, uh, Dr. Hadi Kajibu um, speak to us. He's the medical director of the Scandinavian Eye Center, and he's a consultant to the eye department at the University Hospital in Copenhagen in Denmark. Dr. Kajibu has published uh, numerous papers uh, writes uh, many, many articles and, and, and lectures all over the world. He does 3,000 cataract operations a year. My goodness, that's as much as my entire clinic. And he's performed live surgery uh, in South America, Europe, Asia, Greenland, all over the place. And he's going to talk about us, to us about his very first experience with this technology and his thoughts about where this may take him. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Warren. Um, yeah, so I wanted to share with you today um, my small um, um, sample of, of patients uh, with our, uh, our initial patients um, using the, the Hill RBF formula. And um, these are my, oh, can we move forward, please? <coughs> mm -hmm. There we go. These are my disclosures, non-relevant for this talk. So, as we heard, the Hill RBF uh, evaluates a data set uses pattern recognition uh, based on artificial intelligence. And as you just saw, it's based on quite advanced underlying mathematics. And I have to admit, I don't fully understand what's going on. But borrowing a point from Mike Snyder of the Cincinnati Eye Institute, do I really need to understand the intricate details of this beautiful car's motor to enjoy riding it, driving it? Not really. Um, and the same thing goes for the Hill RBF. So it's pure data-driven artificial intelligence-based IOL calculation method. It performs well on all eyes. Um, it's self-validating. It's the first IOL calculation method that actually gives you the opportunity to go in and evaluate the, the, the quality of the calculation. Um, so that's... Um, a very positive thing. It's constantly evolving, as we heard. Um, I'm echoing quite a bit of what, what uh, Warren was saying. Um, there's a global group of users that, that give in a high quality data to improve the performance. Um, and as we heard, the initial versions were, uh, 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 the initial version was based on 3,400 eyes. Current version is uh, now over 12,000 eyes. Quite impressive. So all of us have our favorite um, virgins formulas for different eyes, and we're all used to kind of looking into actual length and then choosing whatever formula we think would fit best. 
Um, the easy thing with the, with the RBF formula is um, it, it performs well with long eyes, short eyes, and everything in between. It's self-validating uh, in the sense that um, it provides not only information on the power of the IOL, um, but it also shows you information on the quality um, of the predictions. So if you get an inbounds um, measurement or calculation, you can rest assured that the predicted IOL power is going to lead to a refractive result within a plus minus half a diopter with very high probability. On the other hand, if you get an out of bounds calculation, you know that you have a quite unusual biometry and you have to be aware. Um, so, how did the Hill RBF and the LensStar improve our workflow in the clinic? Um, well, it's one formula for all eyes. Uh, we have improved confidence in the prediction. Inbound results give us very good uh, refractions. We have better safety because we can uh, be more aware of, of the strange cases, so to speak. And regarding uh, the, the biometer, I really, I'm really happy using the LensStar for several reasons. Um, it, with one click, you get multiple simultaneous measurements. You have a dual zone keratometry, so it's 32 points in, in two separate rings, one in the uh, 1.65 millimeter zone and one in the 2.3 millimeter zone. Very precise optical biometry, and the measurements are, are operator validated, so it makes it, the system very flexible. Um, the tech can go in and delete, retake, or adjust the measurements. And I just have a quick short video just showing that this is really no nonsense, quite easy to use. Um, just you, within these few seconds, you, so this is an example, just a couple of measurements within 10, 12 seconds or so. Um, there's been some talks that it was a little difficult to use, but we don't find that at all. So then you can go in and look into detail on your measurements. This is the actual length and um, it's very nice to be able to go in and, and double check, see if everything is as you want it to be. Um, if you do want to do some slight adjustments, you can move the calipers around a little bit until you, you're happy with, with the precision. And then when you get the calculations, well, the first thing I do is look whether this is in bounds. And as we heard, if it is, you're a happy camper and you'll have a good result. When you measure the white to white, you have a, a reticle, uh, the red reticle you can see here. And you can go in and resize that and move that around a little bit so it fits perfectly to the limbus. And when you do K readings, you, again, you can go in, watch uh, every single measurement, make sure that it's high quality. And if it's not, you can go in and delete it and retake the measurement again. So that brings us to my small sample here, the first 28 patients, 53 cases, 16 men and 12 women. So we compared the Hill RBF and the Olson formula. Um, I usually use the Olson, Olson formula and I'm very <coughs> happy with it. Um, so it was really interesting for me to compare this to the Hill RBF. Um, we had actual lengths between 22 and 27 millimeters, average K readings between 40 and 47 diopters, and uh, ACDs between 2.4 and 3.8. So um, this is almost like seeing Warren's numbers from before. So with the Olson formula, we hit the 78% mark uh, of accuracy um, with the 0.5 diopter. But with the initial version, the 1.0 version uh, of the Hill RBF, we, we hit uh, 83%. And 98% were within one diopter. We had a few outliers, a few um, out of bounds measurements, but we left them in we, just to, to, to have that. We didn't remove them from the calculation. And then we used the 2.0 um, RBF. And that brought us to over 90% within 0.5 diopters, which was really um, um, quite exciting for us to see. Um, we have 100% within uh, one. Uh, diopter, and uh, that that has kind of um, got our ambitions up. We we were really um, actually surprised to see how how well this performs, and um, and now everybody's kind of 
getting very, very ambitious. We really want to hit higher numbers now. So, so everybody's really being very meticulous. The techs are looking into all the measurements, um, checking the quality of the measurements, um, especially looking at the ocular surface. If there's an issue there, they will um, postpone surgery um, and, and um, optimize the ocular surface, bring patients back and retake the measurements. And, uh, and uh, so, so, yeah, we're looking forward to, to, to hit even higher numbers. So in conclusion, the Hill RBF formula, uh, uh, method, so to speak, um, is the eye oil calculation method for all eyes, independent of the actual length. It improves uh, my confidence in the calculation parameters with the in and out of bounds statements, and in, it a enables us to identify unusual cases with just one glance at our measurements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adi. Okay, next we're going to hear from Dr. Gaurav Luthra, who's the Director and Chief of Cataract and Refractive Surgery at the uh, Drishidi uh, Eye Institute in Durandam, India, and he's been in this position for the last 20 years. He's the past president and current chairman of academics and research of the Interocular Implant and Refractive Size Society of India, and he's a frequent speaker at meetings of all over the world, you know, this meeting, ASCRS, the Academy, the Asia-Pacific meeting. He's performed more than 100 live surgeries um, in meetings all around the world. He's going to share with us how the, uh, the RBF method has impacted what could easily be said one of the busier ophthalmology practices you'll ever see, as, uh, even busy for Indian standards. Thank you, Gaurav. Thanks, Warren, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak here, and a very good afternoon to all of you. And uh, I would like to share a few things of how uh, RBF and the Lenstar have actually changed the way we do cataract practice in the last few years. Uh, these are my financial disclosures. So there were essentially two major events that changed our cataract practice in the last decade, the two big things that really changed our results. And uh, 10 years back, uh, our premium mile practice was picking up, and uh, we were using the immersion ultrasonic biometry with autokeratometers and a few other ways of doing keratometry. 90% uh, of our patients were within about plus one day after metropia, but sadly only about 50% were within plus minus half. We, when we looked at our practice, uh, torics were not a big number. They were just about 2 to 3%. Uh, multifocals, 3 to 4%. We were not pushing them as much. Now, why we were not able to get good results with our patients was we probably lacked the confidence to promise perfect results and emetropia to demanding patients. And... Uh, we had been considering opt optical biometers, had become available a few years uh, before that, and I was discussing with colleagues who were already using that. And uh, at that time, uh, you know, some of them did not inspire so much confidence. They would, uh, in India, we have a lot of opaque cataracts and dense cataracts, so almost 50% of their hazy media eyes, like advanced cataracts, were not measurable. They were not using optical biometry for all their patients, and they were using it for select patients where they wanted to do multifocal, storics. So essentially, it was not a great uh, situation, and uh, they still, most of them relied on immersion biometers. That was 10 years back. Now, in 2011, ACRS, and I don't know if Warren will remember this, but I attended, uh, was attending lectures, uh, as always, uh, with uh, Dr. Hill and so many others and attending some instruction courses and trying to, uh, you know, decide which optical biometer to go with. And uh, that's the time when I was uh, really inspired by the efficiency of the lens star with how it does the keratometry and the other measurements. And I had been, you know, visiting various different practices which were using optical biometers. So, you know, we were wanting to grow our toric practice and multifocal eye results. We decided to go with the lens star somewhere around that time, and uh, that was one of the wisest decisions we made. Uh, the early days with the lens star saw us, you know, we started measuring all eyes, irrespective of what kind of cataract it was, even if it was opaque. We did manage to get through almost 80% uh, cataracts. Uh, that's with a practice which has a good number of uh, dense and advanced cataracts. And uh, for those patients where we did not, we were still taking all the other measurements with the lens star and then entering the uh, axial length manually into the system. And thanks to Arkstride, we were set up with a template which would give us the option to use manual entries of the axial length and then good reliable printouts with the various formulas with the optimized A constants. And since we were getting all accurate measurements of all the other parameters and axial length to as good as it gets, we started getting very good results from our, for our patients, and then all calculations were performed on the lens star. 
So in six months, we started seeing changes, and our refractive results improved significantly. Almost 80% patients were now within plus minus half, which was a big uh, satisfaction to us. Our toric numbers almost doubled within six months because now we were more confident with our keratometries and our results were improving. We started doing a few more multifocals every month. And the most important thing, till then I was so fussy with my biometries, I would try and repeat almost as many as I could. And now suddenly my technicians were doing it well and I found it no longer necessary to you know, go and do biometries on my own and, it, and now I've practically stopped doing it except maybe in a very rare situation. Opaque cataracts, uh, also our outcomes improved drastically. This is where we would get more of our refractive surprises, but uh, except for axial length, we were doing all the other measurements on the lens star, and still our axial length now was more accurate, and we could immediately see outliers. We were comparing both eyes, and if we had a significant difference between axial length on both sides, we would immediately go back and check it again. So that was how it was helping us. With astigmatism, we still continued to do all the other methods of measuring, and as Warren repeatedly says that, you know, you have a primary method and a secondary method, so I do that, like, I have three methods for almost everything, and when I get the data, I have several ways to check all my results, but uh, this is how we used to manage several of our uh, keratometries, but then came the uh, T-cone on the lens star. This was a few years after we bought the lens star, and this also made a huge difference because now we had uh, a more efficient placido. We would do it on our topographer before, but for our torics, now we had this option where we could uh, see the bow tie and then find the reliable axis. So we cut down on the number of ways we would do the keratometry. On the, for all our torics, we would do, do both the T-cone and the other method, which had pretty good consistency, but for the axis, I would look at the placido graph and decide whether I wanted to use that axis. So the toric planner was a very useful thing as well, and uh, I won't go into the details because uh, this is, uh, I, I'm sure everybody knows quite well about it. So what, how the toric uh, calculator helped was that now we no longer had to go to the various company sites and, you know, put in online calculators. We had everything on the machine itself, and that really helped us. Now, somewhere in 2014, uh, thanks to Warren, I got a chance to start testing the first version of the Hill RBF calculator. Uh, he sent us the Excel sheet with which we could work, feed in our data, and we started working with this first uh, set of eyes, which was, you know, a learning experience. And uh, in the before, the pre-RBF days, this is how our printouts would look. So many formulas, if you look there on the left, the holiday, the SRK2, the Olsen, and then you would start looking at various formulas and trying to find out which formula would work well. But once we got the RBF, uh, we started seeing that. We still were doing all the other formulas because RBF was still on the Excel at that time. But we started using that, and we started seeing more and more reliable results uh, where RBF would, you know, give us better predictions. And uh, sometimes when we were this disparities between different formulas, we noticed that the Hill RBF would turn out to be much more accurate in predicting post-op results than the others in many of the situations, and especially for the long guys, as Warren mentioned. And we do a lot of refractive surgery as well, so we have patients who have high refractive errors, my myopias and hyperopias, so we do have more patients which are on the extremes. Soon enough, uh, we had the calculator come online because uh, on the Excel it was not that easy to do, but uh, that was just to get the data. And once the online one became available, life became much easier. We started to use it uh, more uh, for all our patients, and uh, the out-of-bounds function was very useful, and it was updated regularly. And then it came on the Lenstar somewhere in 2016-17. The Hill RBF was put up into the Lenstar. Then things got really nice because we stopped using most of the other formulas. We started relying more on the Barrett's and the Hill RBF. RBF, Barrett's, because we used to do our toric calculations on that. And now, of course, uh, the Hill RBF comes with the Abu Lafia Koch uh, thing, which is pretty similar to the Barrett's toric. So, so essentially, we would have these uh, printouts where we had the Barrett's for our torics and we had Hill RBF. Usually, there would be little difference between the two, but when there was a difference, we noticed, especially in the long guys and the short guys, the Hill RBF sometimes outperforms the Barrett's. In 2018, I think the Hill RBF2 uh, new version has really improved things with much larger, more robust and tested larger database, less patients which have outliers, and uh, dramatically increased range of uh, you know, measurements. And uh, that should read 30 diopters and minus 5. And it's possible to aim for residual refractive errors, as Warren said. So a lot of nice uh, things which have been added to the new version, which we got the update only a couple of months back on our Lenstar. 
especially now with the toric calculator also integrated into that so that is really helping us and uh, there are especially you know i would like to share a few things where the lensstar has now started helping us in a big way and we've been asking this for a long time if you'll notice these you know warnings here this was never there before in a significant way so it tells you if there's a significant difference between the right and the left eye in the axial lens if the keratometries are not accurate so all these errors will come up so that you can go back and check if you have a busy practice and if your technician is doing most of the measurements you could easily see if you know these some of these measurements are not reliable and i think this is a big addition to the lens star so how we are doing our torics if you look at uh, this patient is just about a half a diopter of astigmatism and this is about 0.85 but we do a toric calculation for all our patients irrespective of whether they have more than one astigmatism or less and so many times it actually turns out that you end up using a toric even for patients who are little less than one because of the nomogram for the posterior corneal astigmatism so that's what i meant to share with you we do uh, measurements for all patients and we do use torics and there are patients where your astigmatism will be somewhat more than one but the need for the toric may not be there at all and you may end up not using a toric as well and we do use the virion image guidance system for implantation which again works really well for us so how the or uh, the hill rbf has changed our practice this uh, graph shows this for the torics our numbers went up from 5% uh, to somewhere 9.5 in 2012 after we got the lens star and then with the current in 2018 we have about 17 and a half percent torics for multifocals we don't we are not aggressive at all and in india patients complain a lot with multifocals so these numbers are still good enough for us 8% is now which we grew from 3 and a half percent we use good numbers of toric multifocals as well so about 3 and a half percent of our total practice is about for toric multifocals and you can see that the monofocals have gone down from about 91% to 71% in india this is uh, considered as good you know i i know multifocals are used more aggressively in europe and in the us but uh, we have limitations on our patients uh, not being so happy with our multifocals so these are good numbers so it really helped us and uh, so now today over 90% of our patients are within plus minus a half of emetropia we are doing more and more torics and multifocals than we ever did before we our patients are very happy we hardly get refractive surprises uh, it's very very rare to get them more than uh, one day after our staff counsel patients with more confidence about the outcomes so our, we have seen a change in our counselors you know being more uh, you know sure of what they are saying and we do get a lot of patients referred to us with high refractive errors because of our results uh, from our surrounding practitioners where they will refer off uh, high myopes and uh, you know hyperopes short eyes and i think the hill rbf is really a remarkable tool and we must thank uh, warren for uh, giving us this uh, tool and it's uh, still growing bigger and bigger with more numbers and it's getting better by the day so with that i would like to stop here thank you thank you garav okay uh Next, we're going to hear from uh, Professor David Goldblum. Uh, he's the, the head and anterior, of the anterior segment and oculoplastics unit at the University Eye Hospital in Basel, Switzerland, since uh, 2007. He's also the scientific secretary of the Swiss Ophthalmic Society and has published over 100 peer-reviewed articles. He does uh, cataract surgery and a wide variety of different types of corneal transplants, uh, DMAC, DALC, and the osteo-odontal keratoprosthesis. And um, his areas of interest are device development, including biometry. And he's worked very closely with Hogstride on the development of the Landstar, and proteinomics in the dry eye and, and, and uh, keratoprosthesis. Today, Dr. Goldblum is going to talk with us about a study he did for very short eyes, which is kind of an emerging area uh, that the RBF method seems to do very well in. So David, take it away. Thank you very much, Warren. Thank you very much, Hogstrike, for inviting me again. Um, the next 10 minutes, I want to show you this short study we did on our very, very high hyperopic patients. My disclosures are the one for Hogstrike, which are of relevance. The other ones are not of relevance. So short eyes, what, what does it mean? Hyperopia, axial hyperopia. There's a lot of differences in, in the nomenclature. Uh, one call it microphthalmus, anterior microphthalmus, posterior microphthalmus, nanophthalmus. So there is no clear-cut axial length where, where you can define hyperopia or high hyperopia. Usually what we've heard today as well is uh, an axial length of shorter than 22 millimeters is considered as a, a hyperopic eye or as a high hyperopic eye, um, but there are shorter eyes. Um, just this graph to remind you that all cataract surgeons, I think it's the most difficult and demanding patients, the, the really, really short eyes to do surgery on. Um, you know, the cornea might be small. The anterior sh chamber is shallow or more, most often shallower than a normal eye. 
um, the lens has a regular size and hence the, the iris and the diaphragm is pushed anteriorly and, and that's making the, the anterior chamber very shallow. And there's the special consideration of, of the nanophthalmic eyes where, where you have a thickened sclera and in these patients you, you, you risk uvula effusion syndrome as well. So these are really very difficult and complicated patients to, to treat as well, uh, to do surgery. We were wondering how does it look in our patients um, when, when we go and see really the selective, really, really high hyperopic patients. Um, this is from, from Warren's website, and, and we were wondering, is, is there actually retrospectively um, one of the formulas which will outperform the, the others in these very, very high hyperopic guys? Um, how, how did we do it? Since you see we don't have a, an electronic um, database yet, uh, I had to go to, to the, the person who's, who's buying actually the lenses and ask him that all the lenses we implanted, the SN60 AT, with, who were larger than or long, um, higher hyperopic than 31 diopters, um, I, I got the patient names back. We've, we identified 41 highly hyperopic eyes in, in 33 patients. Um, within 11 years, we went back to 2007 to uh, 2006 to 2017. It's still the RBF version one, which we used. Um, and, and hence you see highly hyperopic eyes are 0.3% in, in our patients in the last 11 years. So it's, it's very rare, luckily for us, because the, the myopic are much, much more often. Uh, and actually, I think they, they are easier to, to surgery on. And also, as we've heard, due to the lower power, the, the actual refractive surprise is, is, is lower than in these high hyperopic eyes. Um, comorbidities, seven of these patients had glaucoma, um, obviously. Fuchs, corneal endothelial dystrophy is, is quite often in hyperopic eyes as well. Four patients had this, and not so many had an age-related macular degeneration. Only three of these patients suffered. I have to admit, some of these patients had to be operated because they had an acute glaucoma. Um, we, we had difficulties. The, the biometry wasn't done all the time with the lens tie. Was, we had before also the IOL master. And in the cases where we couldn't perform optical biometry, we even used um, ultrasonic biometry. Oh, one more funny thing is when I wrote this speech, I looked up again the SN60 by Alcon, the leaflet. Actually, there's a warning. Uh, you can't read it, it just made it small, but there's a warning by the company. Don't use it or use it with caution in microphthalmic guys. Use it with caution in shallow anterior chamber. So <laughs> be aware that, that the company actually um, has, has a disclaimer on that. <laughs> what did we find? Um, quickly going through, the, the average axial length was 20.64 millimeters, so real um, short eyes range from 19 to 22. Um, anterior chamber depth on a mean 2.5, you've, you've heard, but you see there's also some patients that have a bit larger anterior chambers. Um, mean K, okay, implanted obviously from, from 31 to 40 diopters. 40 diopters is the maximum of the SN60 AT. So that's, we didn't implant double, double IOLs in, in these patients. We just went for the highest one in, in a few cases. Um, and average postoperative spherical equivalent was minus 97, which was, looks pretty good on average. But if you look at the range, we had surprises from minus 25.25 to myopic for hyperopic patient up to plus 1.8. So that's. That's how the patients came, came out. Um, obviously, an improvement in, in visual acuity, distance visual acuity, and now to what it looks like. We compared these four, five formulas. Um, as we've heard before, it was on an Excel spreadsheet provided by Warren. Um, this is the original way uh, you had to type in before it was actually integrated in, in the Landstar, um, into the Excel, and, and calculate. So, and I have to say, these, these patients are not actually of the database, of, of Warren's database, which I have provided to patients as well. These are separate patients which have not been in there. Um, what did we find out? That you see with the Heiges formula, about 52% reached the 0.5 plus minus diopter um, accuracy within the prediction. 
if you use the Hill RBF, it's 63%. So if you look at these, there's a trend to the Hill RBF on the version one, but none of these actual formulas had any better results statistically than the other one. So on pure statistics with the Hill RBF one and, and all these different formulas, we, we didn't find anything which was superior to, to the other one. Keep in mind that number, the holiday one, which is supposed to be quite good for, for short eyes, only 37% within half a diopter. We didn't correct for the, the lens constants, maybe that's, that's a reason, um, but that, that was a surprise for us. Warren did the same study at a roughly the same time with different patients and actually found the same results. Um, he, he compared even more formulas and calculation methods and there was no statistic significant difference between these formula in short hyperopic eyes at that time. I think this was also the area of one version. Again, to, to stress, I don't know with his, but our patients, the 43 eyes, these were all out of bounds. So we knew that these are not good calculations with the area of one, but they were all out of bounds, but we used them anyway, just to see. And if you go back here, out of bound, 63% actually accurate in a half diopter. So that's a that's pretty good result. Um, luckily, Warren wrote with his friends this paper. He, he went over the literature and looked at what, what was out there and, and compared what has been out on IOL methods, formulation, uh, formulas, and calculation methods. And, and actually, surprisingly, um, most of the papers have shown the same thing, that there is no statistic significant difference, except if you use the SACR um, two or team models uh, formulas, then, then there has been an advantage in more modern formulas, so probably you shouldn't use them anymore. Um, but in, in highly hyperopic eyes, there was so far no advantage in one of these formulas. Coming to the conclusion, patients with a high hyperopia are surgically challenging you, you should remember that. They, they have ocular comorbidities, as you've seen, uh, which will make their visual outcome less good. I don't think they're good candidates for, for multifocal IOLs. Um, definitely not. Usually you, you want to stay with a, with a monofocal. Actually, the, the, the IOLs there which are produced are not available. Um, one thing which I realized as well is the isolabeling for or the labeling tolerance for these high um, powered IOLs is one diopter, and, and they're also only available in one diopter steps. So getting accurate um, refractions it will not be that easy because we've heard that a high um, powered IOL and the effective lens position will be much more of an impact than in a myopic eye. And if you don't have a, an availability and you have a large tolerance of these IOLs, um, anyway, refractive outcomes might be not as good. So, the best IOL calculation method doesn't exist yet for high hyperopic guys, um, so it's still a challenge for us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, David. And one thing, you know, this isn't a TORIC course, but one thing I might want to mention is that in the new version of the LensStar software, um, we also have now an artificial intelligence TORIC calculator. It's the Avalafia Coke Hill RBF Tor calculator. So the spherical power is done by the RBF method, and then the posterior corneal algorithm is by Dr. Avalafia and Dr. Koch, and then the effective lens position is a variation on, a, on another formula. So, so there's a lot of things that have been added to the new i9 version of the uh, iSuite software that are really worth, uh, worth trying. So we have just a couple minutes. Um, any questions from, from any of you about where this is going or what its capabilities are? Ah, please. Um, what is the possibility that this artificial intelligence method would be useful in the really difficult IOL calculations like post LASIK or post RBF? Sure, that, that's really an excellent question. Is because there we, need, we have so many other parameters that come into play, the relationship between the anterior corneal curvature and the posterior and stuff like that. Sure. So the question is, uh, what if you have an unusual calculation, such as somebody with prior refractive surgery? 
Um, the difficulty here is we don't have a measurement technology, do we? So there isn't a, let, let's say someone's had eight diopters of myopic LASIK. There isn't a machine in the world that can measure that cornea, and that's the good news. The bad news is that the Gould strand ratio, the ratio in millimeters between the posterior and the anterior cornea, is different in different places. So your measurement error here is going to be totally different than it is here, and it's going to be different here. So there's so much mathematical noise that it's really hard to do an artificial intelligence model. It, it might be better, but we, for first we need the measurement technology, and then we can fit it to an artificial intelligence model. So that's why that doesn't exist. So after the, the normal eye, we went to the toric eye, and then perhaps with swept source OCT and a different sampling pattern of the anterior and the posterior cornea, we might have the technology to come up with mean values at a two, three, or four millimeter zone. And then we can go to that, but perhaps you'll be the one to give us that. <laughs> any, any other questions? Yes, in the back. Here, we have a microphone for you. Okay, my understanding is that uh, uh, the 12,000 patients that you have are uh, just the one single type of lens implant. Well, we have to have a prototype for the artificial intelligence model, but it, right. it, it's applied across all biconvex lenses until we get to plus five. And then from plus five to minus five, we're using a meniscus model. So we have to have, we have, to have a prototype, yes. So is it exact? so, I mean, you, you, you just said that, for example, Caucasian, are, Caucasian eyes are different from Asian eyes. Chinese eyes. Chinese eyes. Mm -hmm. Similarly, an Alcon IOL say with an A constant of uh, uh, 119 is not exactly, doesn't exactly behave the same way as an AMO lens or a, as a technus, for example, that is, or, or a, a, a similar lens with, a, with, a, with an exact A constant. Well, yes and no. The, the, answer, the full answer to your question is the A constant is a surrogate for the effective lens position. So let's take the uh, ZCB00 lens that has a lens constant of 119.34. The SN60WF is 119.02. All that means is the AMO lens sits more posterior. Yeah. Lens constant just is more power, less power, depending on where the lens sits. I think what you're referring to is the shape factor, the ratio between the anterior and the posterior radii. And from 15 to 25 diopters, most lenses are equiconvex. There's really not that much of a difference. Um, so the, the artificial intelligence model we used for this is for biconvex lenses up to five diopters. Um, and the only thing you change is the effective lens position. Once you get past five diopters and go down, then it's a completely different model. So, so as long as it's a biconvex lens, the only thing you have to adjust is the, uh, is the A constant, which is the surrogate for the effective lens position. From the practical viewpoint, then, do you use the A constant? Because you have to enter the A constant in, in this formula all the same. That's correct. So do you enter the A constant that is actually on the box no, of the lens? No, you would, you would never, ever use manufacturer's lens constant. This is a warning to everybody in this room. Remember, the, the manufacturer's lens constant is used to get through the regulatory process, and that's early in the development of the lens. One of the reasons why Dr. Haggis's ULIB site was so popular is it took us past the manufacturer's lens constant into what I would refer to as real-world data. Now, if you go to the RBF calculator website, rbfcalculator.com, in the upper right-hand corner, there's a link where it says lens constants. And every lens constant that's used in North America, South America, Asia, Australia, and Europe, and Africa, if you can think of a lens, it's there. I've optimized those for this, and you can look it up, and that's what's used with the RBF calculator. So it's a resource almost as extensive as Dr. Haggis's ULIB site, based on 270,000 calculations. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so Warren, I have a question uh, here, right next to you. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I've, I sometimes get these uh, patients referred who have had a refractive surprise not operated at my place, and they sure. come in uh, with a you know, refractive surprise. And then I wanted to ask you, when can you use the uh, Hill RBF formula to back calculate, you know, like measure these eyes? Because the AC depth will change, there's a pseudo figure, and then how, how would the formula still work? Yeah, well, actually, the RBF method is not meant for that. There's an easier method. If you go to my website, and search for refractive virgins formula, it's a different calculation because when you have a refractive surprise, you already know the power and the position of the lens that's already there, and you know the refractive outcome. So all you need to do is add power to or subtract power from 
the existing optical system. So it's an axial length independent calculation, and it's very accurate. So let's say you, it's a plus one surprise. For most lenses at the plane of the capsular bag, that's about plus 1.5 or 1.6 diopters. You, just, you would just do a bag-bag exchange, and that's what you would use. So it's, you, you want to do that calculation independent of the axial length. The Ks do come into play a little bit, but not as much. But it's a free download in an Excel format from my website, and that's what I recommend using. Also, the Barrett RX formula is made for that, and it's on the Asia-Pacific site, and that does a wonderful job as well. Of course, none of us here have had refractive surprises, right? <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Just a quick show of hands. How many, of you, how many of you track your outcomes? This is wonderful. That's probably more hands than I've ever seen. Usually one hand comes up. So this is a very unique group. I mean, if you track your outcomes, you're here for a reason, which means you want to have you know, better outcomes. And by all means, track your outcomes. Doing surgery without tracking your outcomes is like going to sea without a chart and without a rudder, because you really never know how you're doing. And one thing I would tell you is if you, you have the LENSTAR, you follow the validation criteria that we've developed for this instrument, and you use um, the Hill-RBF method and perhaps double check it with Barrett, as a lot of us do, um, if your half diopter outcomes are less than 90%, you're doing something wrong. I mean, if you think about it, two or three years ago, 1% of surgeons had these kind of numbers. Now everybody in this room can have numbers like this. This is, this is an enormous uh, change for all of us. And uh, as, as Hadi mentioned, you know, once, once you, you start doing this correctly, the light goes on above your head. I mean, it becomes very exciting. I mean, how many of you would love to have 94%, 95% refractive accuracy for your, for your practice? In our office, first day post-op is the happiest day of the week because everybody comes in, they're just, they're just delighted. And everybody in this room can do this. But it does take attention to detail. And one of the transformative things that has to happen in your practice is the doctor now has to play a pivotal role in the process of measurements and calculations. There's this idea of automate and delegate where we have our staff do everything. I have four biometry technicians. They're as good as most ophthalmologists. We still do a lot of the measurements together because I learn from them and they learn from me. And where, is, where better can you put your time than in lens power calculations because you're being judged by your patients and your peers by your refractive outcomes. So this is a wonderful, happy place. And, and once your outcomes start getting really good, it becomes a lovely, happy exercise for everybody in the office. Sure, please. In India, we do, sometimes when we have very hard cataracts, we do manual small incision cataract surgery. Sure. Could one apply this uh, if you're do, uh, not doing a phaco emulsification? Sure, of course. Because your wound is going to be larger, you're going to induce a lot more astigmatism than probably the database that you have collected. Right, the spherical equivalent won't change. So if you flatten in one meridian, steepen in the other, the spherical equivalent stays the same. It's just the... the, um, the power difference between sure. the principal meridians have changed. So it's, it's perfectly applicable. So you do like they do in northern India. Yeah. And that, but extracapsular surgery is a wonderful procedure done in the right hands. It's as good as phaco emulsification. The recovery time is as fast as phaco emulsification. It's just different. And the, the, this would apply perfectly. Thank you. OK. Any other questions? All right, well, I want to thank you all for coming, and on behalf of Hogstrite, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the meeting. Thank you.